three, two, one. Hey Chicago, and welcome back to episode 371 of Speak Your Mind Radio. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Queen Star, aka Miss Hip Hop. And today we're celebrating Black History Month with this gold mind of an episode. Trust me, you don't want to miss it, okay? Um, we will be discussing the first police academy at an HBCU, Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. And also we'll be talking to Chief Gary Hill, one of the co-founders of the Police Academy, and about the importance of this program being implemented into the first Black university in the state of Missouri. <laughs> so without further ado, bringing next up to the mic, Chief Gary Hill. How you doing, Chief? Hi, how are you doing? Good morning, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and I'm glad I got in contact with you and you agreed. Um, so, okay, we start off each and every interview here at Speak Your Mind Radio with an icebreaker question. So let's get started. Okay. Um, Chief, how do you get your students to break down that vicious cycle of us versus them when it comes to serving and protecting the community? I thought you said this was supposed to be an icebreaker question. <laughs> 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 that 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 is a, a very good question. And what we've what we've had to focus on was our recruits have to be our biggest recruiting tool. And so it helps that the majority of my staff, uh, probably 90 percent of my staff is black. Uh, and so uh, as being the chief here and I've been a chief here for seven years and also graduated from Lincoln University. This is my alma mater. So to be able to come back here after a 20 year uh, law enforcement career at the sheriff's office was amazing for me. And so I've tasked my officers with being the example and being the change that they wanna see in reference to how law enforcement should interact with our community. Being an HBCU, it's important that I have the right police officers policing our campus. Um, and what I mean by that is because we have people from all over the nation here. We have people from Chicago, uh, Milwaukee, Atlanta, LA, uh, and they come from places to where, especially Memphis, they come from places where law enforcement doesn't have the best relationship with the community. So I task our officers with being the change that they want to see in law enforcement. And what that has done is, is it made some of the students say, hey, you know, not all not all cops are the same. You know, that is, uh, there is a difference, you know, that uh, maybe, you know, it might be something that I'll consider seeing that I don't have to act a certain way. Uh, and so a lot of people feel that, uh, especially in our communities of color, that once they get into law enforcement, that they have to completely change uh, their person and who they are. Now, don't get me wrong, you have to have character and integrity to do this job. That's the, the biggest thing and the right heart for it. Um, but to see that they can actually get into law enforcement and continue to be their whole self, that is our biggest recruiting tool. And that's what we use to get people uh, to enroll into our academy. That's beautiful. That was a beautiful response and everything that I hope for and imagine for you to say, because the community and the students, yeah, that's the best bet. The word of mouth is to to let other people know that all cops are not the same, you know. So I really like that. That was cool. Absolutely. I always tell them about the, uh, the story of the trooper. Uh, so I'm originally from Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, I try not to tell people that because it messes up my street cred. Everybody thinks I'm from like Chicago or Atlanta or something. <laughs> but I'm from I'm, I'm an Okie from Muskogee. Um, but I remember when I was in high school um, and uh, my car broke down. So I had to uh, drive my grandfather's farm truck uh, to the factory that I was working at during the summer. Uh, there wasn't anything legal on that truck. Uh, didn't have any license, didn't have any insurance, speedometer didn't work, uh, nothing. And I remember driving down 44 and I got pulled over by a true route speeding, but of course, you know, speedometer didn't work. And, you know, he pulled me over and he came to the car and I was like, man, I am going to jail today. Um, and he was like, I need license and registration. I was like, well, here's my license, sir. I don't have any registration. He goes, well, I need to see your insurance. I said, I don't have any insurance on the truck either. And he said, son, you're in a lot of trouble. Why don't you step out? And he took me back there to his car. And I'm sitting there thinking I am about to go to jail. 
And uh, he was like, where are you going? I was like, well, I'm on my way to work. I work at the uh, factory up here um, trying to make some extra money for um, new cleats and uh, some school clothes. And then he put away his ticket book and he said, you know, my son is the same age as you. And yeah, I wish he would take enough initiative and responsibility to be able to do what you're doing. And he go, gave me my license back and he said, uh, don't be late for work. Slow down. And so that whole summer, when that trooper was sitting in that median, he saw me driving past him and he would wave, knowing I was riding dirty. And the only thing uh, legal about that truck was me driving it. Uh, and uh, he never stopped me. And, you know, for me, that meant the world to me because I was like, you know, that's what discretion is all about. When officers use their discretion properly, that's that's what it was meant for, that situation right there. And so that's one of the things that I, I, again, I try to teach at our academy just on how important discretion is and that the change, it's not going to start with the chief. It's not going to start with the mayor and by, it's going to start with the guys who are working in the streets every day. That's right. Definitely. And that was a really good story um, to implement into this story because discretion is everything. Had it gone the opposite way, you would have been a different young man today. More than likely. Yeah. That's what's up. Um, I want to talk to the audience real quick to tell them the importance of the um the story behind Lincoln University, the incredible history. So after the Civil War in 1865, the 62nd and 65th Color Infantry, they decided to save their funds of probably less than $13 a month to start a school because they knew the knowledge was power. The soldiers came up with $5,000 to establish an educational institution for black, free black people. Thus the birth of the first historical black university in Jefferson City, Missouri, Lincoln University founded in 1866. See, <laughs> with a little bit of planning, you can manifest anything. So yes, we have to thank our ancestors for this dream. Absolutely. So, yeah, so with that being said, Chief, why don't you tell us the origin story of how the first police academy came and how it led you down this glorious path. Oh, uh, that well, it, it's a kind of a short. It's kind of a short story, actually. Um, I used to be the site coordinator for the Missouri Sheriff's Training Academy uh, here in the state of Missouri, and so that's another police academy. And while I was the site coordinator, it's actually the academy that I was able to go to as well. But while I was at the academy, we just never had any representation. Even though we're here in the middle of Missouri, um, we're two hours from St. Louis, two hours from Kansas City and Springfield, stuff like that, where the population centers are a lot larger. Um, we just never had any representation. When I went to the academy in uh, 97, there was 26 people in uh, my academy and it was me and one other black person. Um, and then as site coordinator at Missouri Sheriff's Training Academy and even some of the other academies, there would be several years and classes go by where there was no representation uh, from people of color or females, for that matter, in our academy classes. And so while I was at the sheriff's office, I was thinking to myself, you know, Lincoln should really have a, a law enforcement training academy there because they have a great criminal justice program. And I said, uh, I bet you we would be able to recruit more people of color uh, because we would be able to put an academy in a black space. And people don't see the significance of that. But man, if you look at it in our churches and our social groups and everything else, people want to go where they feel comfortable. People want right. to be educated where they feel comfortable. Uh, so um, in 2016, I ran for sheriff and I didn't win the race. And uh, at that time, Lincoln University was looking for a chief. And so I put my hat in the ring to interview and I was able to get here. The moment that I got here, uh, I started speaking with our president and saying, hey, this is what I want to do. Uh, and he told me to run with it. Uh, through two other presidents, they told me the same thing. And I was able to put the pieces together um, to be able to uh, put the academy together. And they were always saying, I don't know if you're going to be able to do this, especially now at this point in time to where I'm just getting ready to put the final touches on it. And then George Floyd happens. Wow. Oh, so now. Uh, 
as we're getting ready to put the final touches on it and everything is going on, there were a lot of people that came at me and saying, you know, this is insensitive that you would even be trying to do this right now with everything that we're going on, that's going on in the nation and the distrust. Um, and I had to push back a little bit and say, you know, at the end of the day, um, in the late 1900s, Black people picked up the badge and was doing this job when race relations were at its absolute worst. Yeah. And so if they could do this job back then, we damn sure better be able to pick it up and be able to do it now. That's right. And, and that was, and I said, because race relations are 10 times better than they were back in the 1800s. And I said, so for us to be able to say that now is not the time, I think now is the perfect time for us to be able to push into this realm. And we need to be able to push into this realm also now because remember, retirements are up because all the baby boomers and everyone else are retiring and police officers and, and police departments across the nation mm. are hiring. So now is the time for us to make that big push to get us into these spaces so that we can get into the foot soldier positions and rise up through the ranks so we can help make the policies that shape our communities. And so that was the total reason why I wanted to get into this and to have our academy to increase the diversity pool for our uh, departments statewide and hopefully move this to other HBCUs around the nation. Wow, that, that is so uh, deeply profound. Um, when you were running for sheriff, you definitely didn't win the battle, but you won the war with this here and you struck <laughs> when the arm was hot. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh, everyone incredible. everyone always says that you know um it was one of those things i had a dream uh i had to try to fulfill it i knew it was going to be an uphill battle i know where i live um i know it was going to be hard press uh for me to be the first african-american sheriff uh in the state of missouri i i knew that that was a, a long shot especially in the small a uh, Catholic town of, of 50,000 people. Uh, the county has about 80,000. Um, I, I just knew it was a long shot. The support that I got, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, there's people to this day that come to me and say, well, you know, we kind of missed the ball on that one, didn't we? Mm -hmm. but, you know, God has a, a God has a plan. Definitely. And God's plan took off on this unique journey. Um, I want to keep talking more about it because it's just the fact that I understood the representation part, you know what I'm saying? I went to school at Lincoln uh, several decades ago, you know. <laughs> what years did you go? I graduated in 2007, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we missed each other by, long, by ways. <laughs> we did, a little bit, you know. <laughs> so the representation wasn't there then, but it was climbing up to the peak of it being the greatest HBCU of all time. To me, you know, in Lincoln University, I'm going to say that because that's my alma mater, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> so you talk about um, the ratio between Blacks and non-Blacks. What about the ratio of men to women in the program? What's that looking like? So uh give you an example. Our class sizes here are small. Um, and I, I kind of like that. I, I like the fact that we I don't ever want more than 15 people in our police academy. And the reason being is we can give that added touch and we can have those personal conversations uh, to where people can listen to one another. because That's just as important as speaking, but to listen to one another for an understanding. Uh, so right now I have uh, we're half and half. So I have uh, five white males and I have one Hispanic male. Uh, two black females and one black male. Wow. And so my classes are, my uh, recruit classes are always that way here mm -hmm. on campus uh, to where that half and half. And that way we can have those uncomfortable conversations and to be able to respect uh, each other's opinions about how we see the world. And that is the secret sauce into, I like to say, what we get to talk about in the cast. I mean, we got to teach the curriculum that the Department of Public Safety of Missouri says we have to teach, but we do what we call Enlightenment Wednesdays. And those are the days that I come in early and they come in early and we have that 30 minute conversation about what has gone on this week or in the world around the nation, law enforcement wise, race relations wide just so that everyone understands that this is what you'll be getting into. And this is why perspective is so important. 
Um, so those ratios of women versus men, black versus white, Hispanic or what have you, those are so important in the classes uh, so that people can see a different perspective. If one person doesn't look like you in the community that you serve. You should get to know them and see their perspective, whether it's religious uh, or anything like that. And that's those conversations that we have. That's why it's so important. That's beautiful. Not only is the class diverse, but it's a safe space to speak about worldly exactly. events. I love it. I'm absolutely um, taken back, I'm flabbergasted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me, like, about the 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 course itself. Like, what what are the requirements to become a police officer there at Lincoln University? And so. Uh... Our academy and my department are two separate entities, if that makes sense. So like we'll say like the Chicago Police Department has their own police academy. In order to work at uh, the Chicago Police Department, you have to go through their academy and their processes. Mm -hmm. So since we're just attached to the university and I run the program, I just get the pick of the litter when graduation comes on who I want to come work here at the academy. But pretty much everyone's a free agent. So after graduation, they can go work for whoever they want to go work for in the state of Missouri and other states that we have reciprocity with. Um, and um, so the requirements to get in are the requirements to get into any academy in the state of Missouri. We have to do a background check, fingerprint check. You can't have any felonies, uh, DWIs or anything else like that. So you have to pass a background check from us first and then the Missouri Department of Public Safety. They do their own background check. Uh, oftentimes, uh, some of the state systems don't talk to each other. So they go through the FBI system, see if they've ever been fingerprinted or committed a crime in any other state. And so once that's clear, then you go through an interview process with us. And so we go through this interview process uh, to where we sit there and we talk, we have a conversation. Uh, because you and I both know someone can go into an interview and straight up catfish us, and then we hire this person. Uh, and then they uh, uh, may not be the person in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so we oftentimes get asked, they go, so if you guys are running the police academy, why aren't you guys doing any psychological testing and, and things like that? Well, it's expensive. We just don't have the funding to be able to do the psychological testing. Now, when they get hired into an agency, their agency will pay for their psychological testing and things like that. Um, I push back against that a little bit as well. Uh, because, you know, you oftentimes hear when they talk about police reform, you know, you should be this officer did this and this officer did that. And he sh didn't that show up on his psyche valve. And so I tell people all the time that the FBI, CIA, NSA, DEA, Department Intelligence Agencies, they do the most thoroughest background checks you could ever do. Hmm. They're still firing people and putting people on administrative leave <laughs> every day. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, <laughs> they still have a process for uh, writing people up and everything else because it's that human aspect of it. Yeah, we it may we may catch something that you know didn't come out, but uh, the best thing that we have in law enforcement to keep officers from doing stupid stuff is active supervision. Mm. Period. Active supervision. What you accept from your employees is what you teach. So if you're a sergeant and you got a couple of guys that are working up under you at the street level and you're not paying attention to what they're doing, it doesn't matter what kind of psychological test or whatever was going on, you weren't supervising, they're doing what they wanted to do and you did nothing about it. So what you accepted from them is what you taught. Wow. That's, that's, that's kind, of, kind of like almost like parenting in a sense. I mean, you know, you can't <laughs> let your kids get away with everything, you know? <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, my grandfather was a pastor and uh, we stayed with him because both my parents were in the military at the same time. So when they would go to some place that's non-deployable, we'd had to go stay with him. And we were in church Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> Ask us, were we doing right? Pastor's kids were the worst. And we <laughs> knew what would happen if we got caught. It's the same thing with adults. Um, we would hope that we got the right person and we would hope that, uh, you know, uh, we just made the right decision. And oftentimes they get into this job and without supervision and experiencing what they're experiencing on an everyday basis oftentimes changes people. That's true. Very true. Um, good point. Um, Chief, last but not least, um, 
tell us some sound words of advice that you would give to an individual out there looking to pursue an education in law in enforcement? So the best advice that I could give is when you go in for your interview, prior to that, research that department. If they do not have sound ethical leadership, take your skill set somewhere else to another police department. Don't just give up. Go to another police department. We are not all the same. Mm -hmm. Go to another police department. Do as much research on that police department before you go work there as they're going to do on you. Mm -hmm. There are other little municipalities within that same area that you may not have been a good fit for the agency that you're interviewing, but you'll be a perfect fit for another agency. Exactly. And we've had that uh, with some of our recruits. We've had a couple of young ladies and uh, men, for that matter, who may have been a little bit overweight. And though they couldn't make the mark of this particular agency because they couldn't run the mile in this amount of time, well, this agency is allowing you to be able to run the mile in this. Don't give up. That's right. We have to have representation in this field for it to change. Uh, so I would always say, don't give up. If you keep applying to this one particular agency and you can't get in, it's probably a reason for that. Let's try to get into another agency. So keep trying. That's keep right. trying. Uh, try to get another education as well. Uh, if you work for a law enforcement agency, if they offer tuition reimbursement and stuff, get that paper, get that education. Don't be a one trick pony. Be able to do something else uh, when the time comes. Because when preparation meets opportunity, that's how we rise. Wow, that was beautifully said. Thank you so much, Chief, for coming on the show. Like, I really appreciate it, um, Chief Hill. Like, this is incredible. This is definitely history. This is what we're talking about. Uh, this makes me feel proud of who I am. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. For sure. And thank you guys for tuning in to another special episode of Speak Your Mind Radio. Please tune in to watch this video on YouTube on the Speak Your Mind Radio and Spotify and iHeartRadio. You can listen to audio. All right. Peace. Don't forget to subscribe. Bye. <laughs>